Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of this YouTube version of the Insightful Astrology podcast. I am so excited about bringing this show back to you and doing it in this format because it's just more fun. It's actually really cool to be able to talk to all of my favorite people and see them and, and have you see us all together. It's almost as good as you being in my living room and us having a glass of wine and talking about astrology and metaphysics and just bullshitting in general. Almost as good. Right, Armand? Almost. <laughs> it's almost as good. It's almost as good. The almost. wine thing would be helpful. I had wine yesterday on a, on a live stream for the first time ever, ever. I never did this before. I'll get into that. First, let me be a responsible host and, and introduce everybody. <laughs> So for those of you who are new here, welcome. My name is Maria De Simone. I'm a professional astrologer. If you stumbled upon this podcast on YouTube, I hope you subscribe and subscribe to my channel for all sorts of cool videos. And you can find out more about me and my work at insightfulastrology.com. This is a podcast that I like to think of as unplugged astrology, where it's real talk, real people, real amazing metaphysicians who have something interesting to share. And so we have really cool organic conversations about all sorts of topics. And today I have one of the most legendary astrologers on the planet. Okay. So get ready because you're in for a treat. I am Armand smiling here, but he knows that he's hot shit. Okay. He knows. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why. So Armand Diaz has been an astrologer for a very long time. I think as long as me or longer. I think we started our careers around the same time, right? So it's kind of <laughs> yeah, but you're younger. <laughs> very long time. But I seem to remember, I've known you for a long time. I, I was trying to figure out, was it 2005, 2006, 2007? You were married and I was married when we first met. So it's a really wow. long time. Yeah, I know. It's, so I'm thinking 2006-ish. We'll just leave it at that. At Bonnie's house. That's when we met. Anyway, for the rest of you, in case you want to know, <laughs> Armand Diaz has been an astrologer for, I'm going to guess, about 20-ish years. And yep. Uh, yep, see, I told you, we started our careers together. And uh, and he is based in New York, like I am, Long Island. So we are fellow Long Islanders. And he is not only an amazing astrologer, but he is a phenomenal teacher, author, he, is, he has a way of bringing very complicated astrological techniques and terms down to reality in a way that even the like astrology for dummies level, okay? Which believe me, I need sometimes. And Armand can, can do that. He can deliver. So he is uh, very brilliant with all sorts of topics, but he has a great sense of humor and he'll deliver it in a fun way. But I have to tell you, go and check out his book. He has written, this was his first book, Interval Astrology. Um, I have... That's why I post it on the Vertex to remind me to talk about the Vertex. Um, Integral Astrology by Armand Diaz. And this is a book that uh, helps you basically understand the ancient discipline in a contemporary world. This was your first book, right? And this, yep, is, yeah. this talks about your whole integral process of, uh, of a holistic approach to astrology, which is really very phenomenal. But the, my favorite book, which you know, we talked about this, is Separating Aspects. And if you can see this, it is about the astrology of breakups. It is a super cool book. Oh, you got that there too. And I have my little, I have my little love notes. You, you, you gave me little love notes in all of these books. I was so honored. You, you don't remember, I'm sure, but I have my little signed copies remember. here. You remember? remember? Okay, good. Now I feel special. So Maria wrote one of the, the blurbs on the back of this book, actually. It's worth, it's worth, it's worth the book. It's worth the price of the book just for that. Just to read my blurb? <laughs> it was a good blurb. I can market people. I got to say. It was, it was yeah. a good blurb. <laughs> <laughs> but this was a fabulous book. I have to say. Amazing. A top Thank 10 you. astrology books of all time. Okay? Now, if I'm telling you that, I mean that. And finally, if you want to find out more about Armand's work to schedule a consultation with him, go and visit his website, integralastrology.net. Is there anything else that I can say? before I officially welcome you and we talk online. What else can I say about you? You have a PhD. You just go to armanddiaz.com. Arm oh, that's another website? You yeah. have two websites? How did I not realize that? Mm. There's two? It's okay. Okay, what, what's the difference? Tell us the difference. Well, it's just easier to say armanddiaz.com. Oh, so and it takes you to the same website. Well, it, 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 you, largely you get there quickly. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Well then either one, armanddiaz.com. Go to that website and you will find out everything you need to know about this man. He does astrology coaching, consultations, you teach, right? You do it all. You, you yeah. And you've got every astrological degree a person can get. Well, there's not that many of them, but yes. <laughs> you are the highest honored. So uh, with NCGR, the National Council for Geocosmic Research, it's a an international organization. And so they do all these testings and certifications. And you are one of the few astrologers in the world who has achieved top level ranking with all of this oh, certification. That's a big bragging rights. So, you know, really you are... Well, that's why when I say legendary astrologer, I mean it. Armand knows his stuff. And he even tried to be my teacher once. So, you know, he tried. <laughs> I have to tell you the story because Armand is a really funny guy, but very patient. And he was so patient that a few years ago, it was around 2018, 2019, Armand said to our local Long Island NCGR chapter, so he was the national president at the time, and I was the president of the chapter at that time. And he had this amazing idea of getting us all certified and teaching us the math, the first level certification, which is the math, constructing birth charts by hand. And I do remember that 20 years ago, when I took my correspondence course, I did it and I passed. But I'm telling you, whatever they taught me 20 years ago was not what Armand was teaching me. So who knows what I learned? Because when Armand started teaching us, it was just a whole different world. And you really were so patient and good trying to teach us degenerates. There were about 10 of us, I think. <laughs> and we were very excited. Armand's being quiet now, but that's because he does, he's trying not to make fun of me because he tends to make fun of me. But he'll do it. You'll, you'll see this. And he tried teaching us the math. And we were, we were you know, we paid attention for the first 10, 15 minutes. But then we... Me personally, I became more interested in the snacks. I became more interested in, you know, cheating with whoever was next to me. There, there was that one woman, Kim, she was very good at math. I tended to cheat looking and you knew, I know. <laughs> but, you know, Armand tried to teach us. What do you have to say about this, Armand? Hey, I, they were really good snacks. You know, you got really good snacks. Um, they, I remember these nuts. I think they were coated with something or other. They were delicious. Wow. Chocolate. Um, that was good. Yeah, thank you for saying that I had so much patience. I had so much patience. And then I would, you know, Saturday afternoon, <laughs> after, after we had class on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, a couple of cocktails. We drove <laughs> you to drink. my patience. <laughs> I, I mean, it was funny. We would laugh, but you could see because Armand really wanted to uh, us to learn what we were supposed to learn. And we just, we were a bunch of fools. We, we, we ruined, so that was a golden opportunity that we will never get back. And we ruined it. I remember one day you tried teaching us at my house. I had just bought my house and it was full of dust and construction and everybody came to my house and you were so sweet, very sweet, brought a little housewarming wine and chocolate. I'll never forget that. And then tried to get into teacher mode. And, and I don't know, that was it. It was just, we, we just decompensated. We became 12 year olds. How did this happen? <laughs> it was it was it was discouraging <laughs> in its own little way, but it was fun. We had a good time. It was just it was just fun to watch the the class started as ten, and then in a couple of weeks it was down to eight, and it was just dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We we tried, we tried. It was fun, but you know, you you will never forget how awesome you are. Now today, what we're going to talk about because Armand does the lecture circuit in the astrology community, he's all over the place. And you are uh, lecturing, you go out of the country, you go everywhere. You're invited to speak worldwide, rightfully so. Uh, we were lucky enough to have you do a lecture for our Long Island chapter about a week and a half ago. And it was on the topic of soulmates, twin flames, twin souls, and the astrological connections. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. And this is based on a research project that you did with one of your colleagues. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that, the, the research project? Well, so 
Uh, among my many uh, projects that I have going on uh, with my colleague Margaret Gray, we had rela we have relationships in astrology, and essentially looking at all the different dynamics of relationships in astrology, all kinds of relationships too. And about four years ago, it was really Margaret's idea to do some research on twin flames, twin souls, and you know what I like to say is really nebulous relationship concepts. Mm -hmm. You know, so we said, okay, let's find out about twin flames. So we came up with a short little description, you know, intense relationship, typically doesn't last very long, lots of contention, but even after it's over, it sort of still lingers with you as a very important relationship. We gave a very, very simple description. And we said, if you've had one of these, let us know. We'd like to look at the charts. And so we got, initially, we got 12 pairs of charts, you know, so we didn't eat get two charts you have 24 charts and we looked at the relationship of twin flame relationships and we were just uh we were very surprised by what we found and uh it was extremely interesting and that and what we did though we didn't ask a lot of questions this is important we didn't you know we didn't ask a lot of probing questions we gave a general description and then let people give us the narratives we wanted to get you know what their idea you know a couple of paragraphs what their idea about the relationship was and this way because otherwise if you you know you you ask the question that you really want to ask you're almost demanding that somebody give you an answer one way or the other this yeah. was like well, just tell us about this and then we were able then to not only say what's going on within these relationships but the particular aspects that have particular types of flavors you know what happens and it's interesting because it was kind of different than what we see in regular synastry or you know comparison of charts in you know even very powerful and good relationships this it, it is so interesting because there's synastry where you just look at the connections between two people's charts. And what you did was you took it a step further and you really dug into the, the nuances of certain romantic relationships. And, and I remember in the lecture, you were talking about it as you, know, you literally divided it up and you talked about twin souls as like that you knew each other since kindergarten and immediately I'm thinking of my brother and his wife who literally met in kindergarten and they're still together. And this whole theory of one half of your soul belongs to each other kind of a thing, which I, I have my opinion about, but, but we'll get to that. Um, so that was the twin soul thing. And then the twin flame is this whole concept of accelerating karma that one person recognizes that, okay, we have some stuff to work out and we must be in some type of short but intense relationship in order to burn off this karma, experience this situation. And then you said typically there's one person who is very aggressive about pursuing the relationship in this twin flame dynamic. And then there's the other person who's like, uh, -uh no, 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 um, no thanks, right? So uh, do you want to expand on that at all? Well, yeah, I, first of all, I, I also think when it comes to the whole twin soul thing, I've got my I've got my opinion about it, too. <laughs> but with the, oh, twin, the, the, the twin flame is actually a little bit easier to work with, because here we have a very dynamic relationship, but it, 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 it's it's problematic. It's almost by definition going to be a little bit problematic or a lot of it problematic. And yet yeah, usually one person is like all in like I, like I, we, we we have to do this we have to work this out mm -hmm. and the other has the opposite it's like well yeah this is real powerful i i'll, I'll see you next life you know it's this kind of i don't really want to be getting into this all that much i'm not i'm not comfortable with it i don't want to you know these relationships come up under all sorts of circumstances. This is this is not like, you know, well, we're two single people that meet on some dating site. This is like, you know, you find this person and maybe you're in a relationship already or they are or both, are, you know, all kinds of things can show you. You live halfway around the world. All kinds of things show up that wind up being problematic for what you would think of as being a normal relationship. And then starts the kind of, you know, we're going to start being loggerheads about things. We're going to fight about stuff and all of these, we're working out all this stuff from, you know, God knows when. And um, really the, um, the, 
the thing is that one person is usually they often called the runner. Well, like I'm the, no, thank you. You know, this is <laughs> not really what I'm looking for. And they have a little bit, a little bit more of like a rational, grounded sort of perspective. And the other person is usually the one is like, oh no, this has got to be. We got to find. We got to figure this out. Uh, the attraction is usually pretty strong on both ends, but one person is really ready to, you know, redo life for the relationship and the other one isn't. And I think that is a really interesting dynamic. And because I'm a Pluto Venus person, I just thought that was normal. <laughs> I, I I have three relationships that I can think of that have that dynamic. But after watching your lecture, I now know that I personally have to stay away from any man who has Sagittarius rising. And we will get to why when we get to all of these interesting nuggets of uh, findings that you have. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with a Sagittarius rising man, so relax everybody. But after learning the specific uh, things to look out for, especially with the twin flame part, for me personally, if you've got Sag rising and you're a man, bye. <laughs> not doing it again in this lifetime. Um, but okay, now soulmates. Now this, so this is what I wanted to talk to you about. And this is where my, I, I think I have a strong opinion, but what do I know? None of us are really going to know until we're dead. I mean, we, we can have all the opinions in the world, but in my opinion, I think it's really just a big umbrella of soulmates. I, I don't really know if there has to be a difference between a twin soul, a twin flame, soulmate. And, and a soulmate to me is really anybody who you have, um, people in your life who you're so contracted to learn lessons from and or teach lessons to. And that includes the twin souls and the, the, the twin flames and all that, that you're still having a soul contract. So while I do very much believe in soulmates and I do very much believe that your soulmate can be your child, your parent, your lover, a best friend, a colleague, a, a marriage partner, and soulmates, it's all of those close people. Um, I'm not so sure that I specifically believe that there is this one twin soul out there. I think our souls are complete. And so that's like my, my issue with the whole twin soul theory. So I'm curious to know your thoughts because you've studied this a lot more and you have more experience with it. So share your opinion here. I agree with you 100%. I agree with you 100%. I, 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 I honestly don't, I honestly don't buy into that concept. Um, you could have a really good relationship with somebody and, uh, and they could be a soulmate. And I, but the, the idea that like, the, that, you know, it's the other half of your soul or something like that. I, I, I agree with you. Like we are really complete. And the idea that you're out there looking for someone to complete you that's that's an awful job to ask of somebody, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you know, could you, you know, could you please fulfill me in every way? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, that's that that's um, that's a bit much. And I know that there are, I know that there are people who have really wonderful relationships that are that have that sort of faded quality to them. That you know, that that there's this numinous glowing. And there's, there's a sense of sometimes past life. I know that this is the case, but I don't think that there is that one person out there that is, I, and I I have done a lot of research on the whole twin soul yeah. thing, and I just, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not buying it. I'm actually- I don't, I don't feel, no, go ahead. You no, know, I'm, I'm actually grateful that you are in agreement with me because I wasn't sure if we were gonna get into a bit of a debate right now or not. I didn't want to say anything during your lecture, but I'm, you know, I, I hear people say this to me in, you know, client work, or even if you're on random YouTube videos, you will hear, especially Tarot readers talk about, oh, he's your twin, or she's your twin. Yeah. And I kind of want to throw up in my mouth when I hear that. And I've been told this, people have told me this. And I'm like, well, how can it be that this guy was my twin in 2017, but now there's this whole different person that's my twin in 2019, but they're both twins. How many twins do I have? How many pieces is my soul? Quadruplets. You were quadruplets. <laughs> we're all soulmates. We have a soul contract. This one was particularly shitty. This one was really nice. This one turned into a friendship. You know, it's just these are the soul contracts. And and I prefer to look at it as an umbrella of soulmate theory. So that's interesting. And I know we're going to get a lot of comments from people.
people who are very invested in this whole twin flame, twin soul idea. But don't put somebody yeah, else's yeah, happiness yeah. in your in, in don't put your happiness in anybody else's hands. Right. Yeah, that's 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 the big mistake. Uh, they, I, I I think that's a very big mistake. And I think you know uh, we over invest in romantic relationships in our culture um we're, we're a very secular material kind of culture and there's not a lot of the mystic there's not a lot of the specialness and where we get it by and large is in romantic relationships it's that falling in love experience where you you know like you you drop some of your ego and let somebody else in and they do this and it's this wonderful experience it's a great experience don't get me wrong um but it's the only way we really get it is through romance we don't you know we, we rarely get that through other means you know you have to really develop your spirituality and so on in order to really have uh, uh, that experience or sometimes spontaneously or whatever but we over invest in romance for that reason it's it's the thing that feels so special in an otherwise kind of humdrum kind of world for a lot of people and but the idea that it's one other person that's going to you know that's going to fulfill you completely or something like that it's just mm, so it's not a... now that our minds and i have completely crushed your romantic notions <laughs> let's have why is that? it's great it's gonna fall in love but it's 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 not it's you know there's not just one being out there for you you know i mean it's the more open you are the less the less <laughs> the less restricted you are to there being just that one person who would you know fulfill everything for you yeah oh for sure so now i would love it if we could get into some of those juicy connections that you and margaret found and so, in the mate umbrella <laughs> so well but think about this because we really were looking for twin flames now yeah. i i maybe disagree with the theory behind it that there is one person that but twin flames are difficult relationships right yeah. and yeah. in this case we're looking at a difficult but very special relationship so it has that real special quality but it's also really difficult so, so whatever the theory is these relationships do exist these okay. relationships do exist they, and they, they, and they do. follow those patterns they you know. do. And I have two examples to, to talk about or to show if, if, you know, anybody wants to see it. But so I would I would just say these are soulmate connections that have particularly difficult karmic implications. Yeah. And, yeah. and so people define that as a twin flame. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there is only one. You can you could repeat this pattern. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you, you know, I know you're not going to talk about your experiences, but I'm an open book. So I'll talk about mine. I have repeated this pattern. Um, so, so we're going to talk about the twin flame research in particular, the findings of. Right. Right. Okay. That, that's, that's really what we, that's really what we re researched. Um, so what we found were there's connections uh, and in any, in any way, but there's connections, multiple connections. Mm -hmm. among the moon mm -hmm. the lunar nodes neptune and the ascendant descendant axis there's yes. multiple between the people there's mm -hmm. not just, and and you pointed this out actually conjunctions conjunctions yeah. we're not talking about trines and you know and 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 sextiles and even squares conjunctions is what we're is what we're looking at so can you explain for everybody what, why the lunar nodes would be significant in this particular dynamic? Because there might be some people who don't understand what the nodes represent. Well, you know, what the nodes represent, you know, pick your book. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this, is, this is an ongoing, evolving thing. But um, I think evolutionary astrology has brought us to the point that, that most astrologers have dialed into the idea that the south node is representative of your past this is like a past life past mm -hmm. and, and because it's from your past life it's like the default program that you come in with right, right. this is you know it's and, and and it's it's the way that you need to learn to be again you know mm -hmm. you need to learn to be your south node again and then you need to move up to your north node so th the lunar nodes 
they they represent the past life and then where you're meant to go in this life, the south node and the north node. And so when there's a connection with those nodes, it's very likely that you're connecting with someone from your past. This is again on the assumption that you know this a, that that you're you're comfortable with the reincarnation. If you if you if you weren't, I suppose that you could sort of just say it as an analogy. But yeah, but if you're subscribing to the whole soulmate theory in general, then you probably believe in past lives. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think we could talk about it in that in that way. And so these south, let, let's break it all down. These south node connections. And again, we're sticking to the conjunctions because the conjunctions are palpable and very urgent and, and close orbs, right? What, what was the orb that you guys were using? Well, it wasn't the orb that we used. It was the orb that we found. I mean, we were, we were within two or three degrees. Okay. Yeah. And we're, we're really, we're really looking at, and because it's the nodes, it could be to either node, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, we we found very close, like within, within a degree or two, very, very close connections. And, and so typically if somebody has a South node connection to somebody else's chart, then they're bringing back that it's a past familiarity. However, it's holding them back. And that could be part of the problem, right? Yeah. So connection <laughs> is on the South node, then we're looking at, yes, this is, we're going to go back and we have to re, we have to work out stuff from the past. And there may be some stresses in there that come from the distant, which is the hard thing to work on, isn't it? Because it's like, you know, like you're really pissing me off because of what you did back in the 14th century. I don't even know what it was, but it's, I'm really sick and tired of you and you're Sorry. <laughs> north node connections. If it's on the north node, uh, it, it tends to be a little easier. It's like, yeah, we do have past stuff, but maybe, you know, it's to help pull you forward a little bit more. You know, it's so and, it's a little and easier. And they're there. nicer. Theoretically, they're supposed to be nicer because they pull you forward. But you know what I have found? I have found that pe people are funny. If you have a choice between a relationship with someone who is more north node and someone who is more your, hitting your south node, People invariably go south node. I don't know if you've noticed this or looked at it or if you and Margaret like have found that, but people um, will go for their past relationships or situations. They get pulled into that dynamic, like hypnotic level versus saying, oh, let me be conscious and grow and go for this person instead because their Venus is conjunct my North node and that might be something really good. You know, instead they go for the Neptune South node person or, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, I mean, it's, you know, familiarity, right? It is, and it is, you know, uh, the moon too, but certainly the moon and, the, but, but uh, the lunar nodes, they are, yeah, it's like a, a vortex that you just get, you know, it's like you're, you're getting too close. It's like a magnet that you're getting too close to. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like or a whirlpool that you can't help but look at until you get sucked down into it. Yeah, the, the South Node has that, has that, uh, I mean, it has that even just in your own chart. But yes, when somebody's landing on your South Node, it's a little irresistible. It is. Now, speaking of irresistible, those Neptune contacts, they are, oh my God, just scary dangerous like you don't even you lose yourself with the neptune contacts don't you yeah yeah very yeah. frequently losing yourself is maybe the way to describe it um the thing about now if there's a neptune kind of thing leave aside the nodes yeah you don't necessarily feel that it is a you, you're not like thinking oh this is like a past life thing it very very frequently it is especially because mm -hmm. neptune to the moon seems to be particularly powerful Mm -hmm. uh, but with Neptune, it's just, this is so special. That yeah. relationship is just so special. The person is so special that, you know, it, it's like, it's glowing. It's Newman. How could it not? How could this not? One of my clients said that actually about a, a Neptune thing, you know, this a relationship that it, 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 bare, it, it wasn't, it wasn't really. And, and, but her description was, how could this not have happened? You know, how, how could, there's so much potential in this. How could it not happen? 
And that, feels, that's what Neptune does. It feels magical if you're in it. If you're the one in it, it feels magical, these Neptune contacts. But if you're an outsider looking at the couple or trying, if you're friends with one of the people in this relationship, you're likely seeing something very different as an outsider. If your Neptune's not involved, you're looking at it as it is. They're looking at it in a very different way. And you're there scratching your head saying, what are these two knuckleheads doing? <laughs> they need to wake up, <laughs> snap out of it. And, and if you're in it, you, you're gonna go through it. You're gonna be in it very deeply. Um, I have, so I, I have one Neptune experience. Well, I mean, uh, the twin flame, both of the twin flames were very Neptunian, but one of them in particular, my cousin Joe said to me once, and, and I'm sorry, you can close your ears. It's gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk Maria for a minute, uh, but I'm quoting somebody else. This is not actually me, this, but he helped me to understand the Neptune interaspect situation very well. <laughs> so, I was convinced I was in love with this man. Convinced. You couldn't tell me anything. I was, I was in it. It was just like, boom. He followed me into the ocean. I thought it was the most romantic thing in the world. I was hooked. Okay. And Joe literally said to me, Maria, you're not in love. You're just basic. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, look at all your Neptune. Look at the Neptune. And he had to say this to me. And sure enough, there was just so much Neptune in that relationship. I was not seeing it clearly. So you're drunk. You know, you're definitely not seeing it, but it's it's very soul mating. <laughs> Well, saying that you're drunk is exactly right because it, it, that's what happens, right? It's like, you know, you, you're having your fourth glass of champagne. And like, this is wonderful. And everybody else is going, like, mm, maybe, maybe you should have a cup of coffee and sleep uh -huh. it off. Yep. Oh, for sure. The moon is hard, though. When you got all the contacts with someone's moon, that, because that can genuinely be a beautiful relationship, I think. If you got oh, half the moon. So, what do you think happens to turn a positive moon connection relationship into one of these twin flame unhealthy dynamics? Well, remember what we found was that you get a lot of these aspects. So you'll have like, you know, Neptune on the nodes and then you'll, or, or you'll have I don't know, the, the nodes on the ascendant and then Neptune on the moon. So it's not just by itself, right? We're not just talking about one thing. We're talking about Neptune getting in there with some of these other aspects that are going to be more problematic or, 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 or the moon being brought in. But you know, the moon, I mean, we're talking about the lunar nodes, right? The lunar nodes are the nodes of the moon. So the moon itself, it's, you know, it's your comfort zone, it's your, it's your sense of security, it's your inner, it's your emotional set, right? Yeah. But the moon itself tends to draw you backwards. The moon, you know, this is, this is set early in life or prenatal even. This is your early, early experiences and it, undoubtedly it comes from the past and past lives as well. So the moon itself is kind of regressive. The moon kind of pulls you backwards by itself. You know, that the moon, it, maybe a moon in Aries is going to give us a bit of an exception here, but the moon yeah. generally tends to pull us backwards. And so uh, if there's a connection with the moon, with all these other things going on, then it brings back, it brings up the more regressive past uh, aspect of the moon, as opposed to the more forward looking, how do I deal with things now aspect of the moon. So something particularly dangerous might be a moon conjunct south node or, uh, you know, moon yes, Saturn yes. south node. If you even had something like that, that could be really troublesome. Really, really interesting. Saturn showed up uh, not as much as, as the ascendant and the moon and Neptune and the nodes, but Saturn showed up more than you would think. And Saturn is, you know, Saturn is the Lord of karma, right? Saturn yeah. is the Lord of time. And, you know, in, in a sense, I think he shows up to say, okay, well, you know, you guys really should work this out, don't you think? <laughs> you know? so, so the Saturn findings were not prominent in the twin flame, the unhealthy relationship. It was more in the soulmate. No, they, no, they, it, it showed up. It was, it was it le much less frequent, but it was, it was conjunctions and it was, it was like sort of tied up with these, with these other things. 
um, that, you know, and it, it seemed it seemed to show that there was, you know, that there was work to be done. I think that generally speaking, I think that it, it helped. I think that the overall flavor of the relationships turned out to be a little bit better when Saturn was one of the things that was involved. And if it was, you know, you leave it all to Neptune, like, you know, if we're here to work out something from a past life, you know, yeah, and we got Neptune, you know, that'll get you in, but is it going to help you to sort things out? Yeah, Saturn's yeah. better. Saturn is, Saturn's a reason to stay. Saturn is, you could sink your teeth into something. You know, it's, you know, it's real. You know, you're not delusional if there's some Saturn involved. Yes. Yeah. You've got an <laughs> issue, but you've got an issue, but, but it's real. You know, you've got an issue, but you can yeah. deal with it. You can, you know, you can work with it, you know? Yeah. That's oh, good. That's, that's a, that's a really great point. So nodes, moon, um, Neptune, these are the, the three main contacts and usually conjunctions. That's what you really focused on. And it's a tight orb, maybe two, three degrees. So that's, I'm summing it up. Is there anything else with the ascendant, the ascendant, the ascendant axis? Cause we know that's me and you, that's the yeah. axis of me and you. So if you have, again, any of those things land on the ascendant, descendant axis. Yeah. Right. You, I remember you also talked about how common it was to find the um, opposite ascendant, descendant axis in couples with, uh, yeah. so, you know, one person has cancer rising, the other has uh, Capricorn rising. So they're opposites. Uh, that's common. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So those, those were the top findings. Now, what, what I'm going to do for fun in your lecture, you gave us all sorts of uh, random charts to look at. So I, I just pulled a couple of my charts because, you know, this is real life astrology and I, I just easier to do my own life. And I'm going to quickly show you how Armand and Margaret's research it comes to life in reality. And then Armand and I are going to add another point, which you and Margaret expected to find, and you didn't, but we talked about this and we're like, that was a fluke. It has to be there. And, and it is, and, and we, you're going to see it in all my chart examples, and it is the vertex, which we'll, we'll put a pin in the vertex. We'll talk about it in a few minutes, but I do, I'm going to show when you said that Neptune node. So here's, here's the problem for someone like me. For someone like me, that becomes a particular karmic issue right off the bat because what is maria born with a moon neptune conjunction widely conjunct the north node okay so i'm made up like that and remember i said your lecture taught me to stay away from men with sagittarius rising <laughs> oh yeah well that is the reason because it is going to really highlight what exactly what your findings were about this twin flame runner chaser dynamic and this intense, crazy karmic nonsense. And so sure enough, as I was listening to you talk, I said, oh my God, literally the, uh, there, there were three, but one of them I don't have a birth chart for. So we'll, we'll, we'll not talk about the eye doctor, but these two, I actually had real physical relationships with, even though situationships is probably the better way to term it. So I put them as twin flame possible. So there's two twin flame possibles here. Uh, this, well, actually, no, we'll go to the first one. This is the one who actually has become a very dear friend. And I don't know if your twin flame research would support this. Probably not, because usually twin flames don't go from passion to, oh, yeah, we're buds, right? But that's what ended up happening in this particular dynamic. But he he does have Sagittarius rising. And what that basically means is that according to this research of the moon and Neptune, my moon Neptune conjunction is bang on his ascendant. My node, the nodes are a little farther apart if this is an accurate birth time, but that because I have the moon Neptune conjunction, I would consider it able to pull it in, to kind of pull it closer together. And so that means that my south node is on his, is over here on the seventh house side. And that was, this was literally a relationship where I met him, he followed me into the ocean. It was a very short, passionate love affair. Then I found out I was the other woman. I didn't know I was the other woman. And it exploded into uh, me being, I just, I ended up calling the other woman. It became a very ugly situation. And the reason why, 
we are still friends is because a couple of months after this happened, he actually found me. He went and found me at the beach at my spot that he knew he could find me at. And he is the only man in my life who has ever apologized to me for hurting me. And that's probably because of his sweet cancer moon and the Pisces stuff. He apologized for hurting me. And he said, I, now you can see this is true. When you look at his chart, I fell in love with two women and I didn't know what to do. And because I could see it in the chart, you know, Venus and Pisces next to Saturn, square the Jupiter and seven, I believed that he was not lying. I could see that he is somebody who is capable of that. And it became messy and he tried to make it right. And he actually ended up helping me find my house and we went house hunting together. His cancer moon like became the sweetest thing for me. He went to home inspections for me. So I became friends with this messy twin flame situation, but he was the one multiple Neptune contact. His Neptune is exactly opposite my Mercury and my sun, and then the nodal situations that you mentioned. So, um, so that was one of my examples that I was thinking of while you were lecturing. And then the other one, this was the other messy one, another Sagittarius rising. And this is the one that I met when I actually bought my house and moved here. And, and the, twi the, the flame thing is interesting because like you said, you meet these people in very unusual circumstances often. So one of them followed me into the ocean. This one rang my front doorbell. So literally rang my front doorbell. And same thing, same thing, my moon and, nor and um, Neptune conjunction, they're on his ascendant north node. Now he has Neptune in Sagittarius, which was actually next to my north node too. So same type of dynamic that you were referring to. And I just thought it was so interesting because I had two clear examples of that in my, in my brain to kind of bring that to life. So I wanted to just mention that. I don't know if there was another example that you had of, um, of this particular dynamic that you could think of before we go on to this vortex topic. Well, you know, actually looking at your charts, the, you you had another thing with both of these with, with both of these guys that uh, that we found to be rather typical, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 I I really thought it was anecdotal, but because it didn't seem like it should necessarily make any, uh, it didn't seem like it should matter all that much, but there's an age difference with both of them. One was older, and the other was younger yes and, you mentioned and, that yes i i meant to mention that i remembered you said that one was eight years older than me one was eight years younger than me and you said that was something you found with the twin flame people the average age difference was seven seven plus years which is exactly a quarter of saturn cycle uh -huh. Right, it's a seven-year difference. It, it it's a it's when Saturn it, it starts here when it, at twelve o'clock it gets to three o'clock seven and a quarter years later, and that's exactly the difference that you had with both of these guys in different directions. Yes, yes. You know, and that really that really seems to be you know that that's if you're if you're working with the idea there you know if you're working with the idea, then it's kind of interesting that. It is a it is a, a, a Saturnian number because seven is a Saturnian number, right? With that's you know it, it's actually mm -hmm. it is the seven is a Saturnian number for real for real, um, but it it's almost seems like the relationship between the two people it it's not gonna it's not gonna be peers. In in the in, in like the most direct way, you know, it's not like we're 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 both together since the beginning, you know, like everything is the same. No, there's a difference between it. One is older, one is young, and it, it doesn't really seem to affect. It doesn't seem to affect at all which way, you know, like it's not like the older person is the one that's going in, and the younger person's the runner, or vice versa. It doesn't work like that at all, as far as I can see. Um, yeah. but th that age difference really seems to be significant. It's like, mm, already the, already the deck is sort of being stacked in a certain sort of way. It's going to make it a little bit, a little bit tougher. You're going to be in, and you know, astrologically, like it's that quarter of a Saturn cycle that, yeah, that's an age difference that makes a difference. 
Yeah. Three years doesn't make a difference, especially, you know, I mean, when you're in high school, three years makes mm -hmm. a difference, but it doesn't make a difference at a certain point. Four years, five, seven years is always a significant difference. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect, it doesn't mean that it's impossible, but it's always a significant difference. Man, so I got to stay away from sad rising men who are seven plus years younger or older than me. That's what I learned from your lecture, Armand. Thank you. <laughs> see if you can see if you can restrain yourself, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. So now let's talk about another very cool point. Uh, I really, I talk about this when I teach my relationship astrology class and it is actually the only time I use it. It's the only time I talk about it. Uh, but I do think it is one of those important little nuggets in a birth chart that is, it's got to be a conjunction. It's got to be close math, but it can wow you. It is this faded point called the vertex. Now, you are much more brainy than me. I have my post-it here. I have my little cheat note here. Would you like to define the vertex for us, Armand? Not really, no. <laughs> um, it is... <laughs> It is it, it it is a it is just it's a meridian that is um I, I don't I don't know how I, I can define it. it. I can help you. I got it. Do it. Do it. Okay. So the vertex is a point in the western hemisphere, which is the right side of your birth chart, that is an intersection between something called the ecliptic and something called the prime vertical, oh, and it is yeah. considered an auxiliary descendant. Now the ecliptic is basically the apparent path of the sun around the, the constellations. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Half? Okay. And the prime vertical, which you tried so hard to teach us back in that math class, it goes, it's top to bottom. Am I remembering? Yeah. It? yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Okay. <laughs> See, I learned something. So it's this imaginary line on the earth, prime vertical, top to bottom. And then you have the ecliptic here. And so this vertex point is this the, um, intersection where those two imaginary points intersect. And that becomes a faded point in your birth chart. And it acts as almost like a secondary descendant, which is why it can be so powerful in synastry. Um, but in particular, I have to say, I, I have plenty of birth charts that are not even romantic in nature, but I have found very close contacts to vertexes in family relationships, friends, and romantic. So what do you have to say about the vertex in your experience? It, it, it brings people in. It is not specific as far as I can see to romantic relationships or anything like that. It is just important relationships in your life when somebody is on the vertex. But here's another thing. If you're having a transit to your vertex, right, is a time when you're likely to bring in somebody who's very important, even if they're, they, don't, they don't have anything on your vertex. Oh man, I got to go back and look at that. That makes so much sense. Oh, that makes so much sense. Okay, I got to go back and look at that. And I have I have eclipses and progressions coming up to my vortex. So I'm going to test that. Oh, yeah, wow, good, good and for you. Report, and report back. But this, so this vertex, I have tons of examples. So when you, when you were giving the lecture, I was like, I, I got mentally blocked. I was like, how is the vertex not there? And you were making fun of me. You're like, Maria, <laughs> you're not paying attention. <laughs> like, I'm not mad. I'm so <laughs> blocked. So yeah, like I said, Armand makes fun of me. Before the before he gave his lecture, a bunch of us astrologers went out to dinner. And he was absolutely making fun of me because I eat too slow, apparently. I, I didn't know this about myself, but Armand has acutely observed this about my character, that I am the slowest eater around us and i guess you're right i am I guess it's because you're a taurus <laughs> tauruses eat slowly there's i i you they uh, no no cut on the ability to consume but that's definitely there but for, they'll always be the last pe person at the meal and everybody else had their meal wrapped up in a little doggy bag ready to go and it was maria with the rigatoni on the end of the fork just <laughs> Oh, Armand's right. I do eat slow. So what? I rush through math. I do math way too fast, but I eat way too slow. <laughs> we go eat because it's more fun to eat than it is to do math. Very true. So now I'm going to show you guys my. Oh, but, but I want to make I want to make one point about the vertex and yeah. even like with romantic. 
remember we were looking at difficult twin flame relationships right so the fact that we didn't find venus let alone the vertex venus wasn't particularly implicated in the whole thing so it doesn't mean that it wouldn't be important for all kinds of relationships it just meant that it wasn't important for these relationships as far as we saw and that makes sense because i did not have vertex contacts with the two sad rising men there were not I, but with my ex-husband and with my family members and my best friend there's exact contacts that i'm going to show you However, one of those people, I also had his ex-wife's chart and he has an exact vertex Venus conjunction. So he married her, that's, you know, so it's a different, it's a different relationship. So, yeah. so we're gonna go back to now this vertex and you wanna check out the vertex in your chart guys, but um, you know, remember you need an exact birth time. For, for points like this, it, I, I don't know how it works exactly, but I think if you're off by by two or three minutes, it's going to change the degree of your vertex, right? Yeah. Something like that. Okay. So the vertex will always be on the right side of your chart. That was defined in, in the little post-it definition. And so my vertex is here at 10 and a half degrees of Libra. And that's all you need to remember about that. Uh, now we're going to go to the one person I actually married. Where is he? <laughs> So the one person I actually married, okay. So now this is uh, his birth chart. You know, Taylor Swift, she writes songs about all of her exes. I don't know if you know this about Taylor Swift. Me, I just show their birth chart. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's that's me. Okay, so, um, oh, I wanted to show you the chart actually that has his vertex. This one, not the right one. So now we have both of our, uh, our vertexes. If you remember, mine was 10 and a half degrees of Libra. Bam, that is his ascendant. My ascendant is 24 degrees of Aries. Bam, that's his vertex. So in the seventh house. Yes, yes. And so when the, and and this is interesting because you know these are this was a marriage and that other you know one of my sad rising people who was you know the twin flame theoretically he married someone whose vertex was next to whose venus was next to his vertex in cancer so uh so that is is very interesting but these vertex contacts are um oh and and this one also his uh saturn was exactly conjunct my south node so that was, um, and and uh, oh, there was another thing about the, the something. Oh, the, the opposite ascendant descended that you brought in your lecture. Remember you said uh, yeah, most yeah. a lot of times that happened. So that that actually did happen in this case. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show about about his chart. But with this vertex, it's everywhere in my life. Okay, so my best friends in the world. This is her birth chart. Her vertex is right here, exactly conjunct my moon, okay? Ex this is so close. My daughter, my daughter and I have a vertex connection. Her vertex is exactly conjunct my son, my sun sign. And my daughter's vertex is exactly conjunct her brother's Saturn placement. Oh, I didn't put my son's chart here. Did I? Yes, I did. Uh, so, my, so as brother and sister, they have this exact vertex Saturn conjunction. And was that it for the vertex that I wanted to talk about? I think so. Yeah, I just wanted I just wanted to bring the topic up so that you guys can explore the vertex for yourself in your charts. This is something that is when it comes to synastry, you know, normally I'm a purist and I'm very I only use the planets. I don't even really use Chiron when I do consultations. I use the planets. I use the major aspects. I am a boring purist. But when it comes to synastry, I tend to branch out a little and the vertex is one of those points that I will always look at for this reason. So do you have anything else you wanna say about the vertex? Not really, <laughs> that is, except to say that, yeah, it is really, really important and it shows up. And, and look at those connections that were like, it's, it's always fun to look at family charts where you see, you know, your son Saturn is on your son and the, the, the whole, the whole thing, the whole thing that it, it just, you see the same themes coming up over and again and with the revert, and, you know, I, I could go on and on, but you know, there, 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 you find so many interesting connections with the vertex. It's always something that is worth 
you know, taking a look at, seeing what happens. Um, and yeah, and look at transits to it as well. That I'm going to really look into. Yeah, my, my ex-husband's sun sign is conjunct my son's vertex. So they have a, so me and my daughter have a vertex sun connection and him, my son and his dad have a vertex sun connection. It's, it's really in all of your core soulmate relationships, I will say, I think the vertex is showing up. Um, oh, unless, yeah, it's a okay. plane, unless it's one of those weird runner chase, trade chaser relationships, then maybe not so much. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would agree entirely. It, it, I, I was very surprised that it wasn't even part of those. Um, Vertex, I mean, I, I think that, you know, faded encounters is the way they're often, the vertex is often described. It's like when something lands on your vertex, faded encounters. And I certainly seen, I mean, you know, this is, your family there is, you know, that's a great example of it. You know, it's like the whole, like, well, we'll, we'll come together to be a family and start working stuff out and things like mm -hmm. that, you know, see what we can learn together. You can't escape your fate. And it shows in the <laughs> vertex. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, as always, this is always, it's always fun to talk to you. And, uh, this, you know, I always learn so much from you when that this one conversation, you taught me something. So now I have a future research project to track my vertex and, and mm -hmm. go back in time and see what, what happened when I met these people, if, if I can remember, you know, what we it's interesting stuff. This is what us nerdy astrologers do for fun. You know, the rest of the world goes out, I don't know, dancing and I don't know what the rest of the world does, but nerdy astrologers do this. <laughs> That's how all this stuff gets discovered is Saturday nights when astrologers have nothing to do, but look over old charts and go, oh, what? <laughs> yeah. What was okay. happening that time? Something exciting happened to me. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here on the third podcast. And I hope you decide to come back and talk about anything you want, because you are just, I have described you, my, my students are like, I have a bunch of students who are big fans of you and your work. And when we talked about you, we had a conversation about you and I describe you as, you know, there are Uranian astrologers and there are Neptunian astrologers, meaning the Uranian astrologers are really brainy and scientific and know their stuff academically. And then the Neptunian astrologers are very intuitive and can really blend information and all that. I qualify myself as a Neptunian astrologer. And it is so rare to have an astrologer who is both Uranian and Neptunian. And I say you are both. That is another reason why you are a rare bird. You are both. Because a pure Uranian astrologer, they can be dry and boring. Pure Neptunian astrologer like me needs a post-it to explain the vertex. <laughs> But you are you are both. And so everybody go check out armandiaz.com. Book a session with him. You will not be disappointed. And I hope you all learned something from today's podcast. Armand, thank you so much for joining. I love you. Thank you, Maria. Bye-bye. Hope to eat, eat dinner with you soon again. <laughs> <laughs>